Hebrews chapter 10 is where we'll be this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 39. A couple weeks ago, we looked at a couple of verses that are often quoted and we often talk about, but it's something that we need to think about a little bit more. And that was verses 24 and 25, which says that Christians should come together and meet in groups so that we can consider each other and stir one another up to love and good works. So without this regular encouragement and stirring up, we all drift towards an earthly, fleshly uh, life, and we drift towards apathy and creature comforts and security. But in a world like ours, love and good works will be costly. It will cost you something. And they will interrupt our material comforts. They will jeopardize our worldly security and demand the end of our apathy. In other words, love is not cheap. They will, the good works will interrupt our thoughts. It will interrupt our actions. It will interrupt our plans. It will interrupt our feeling of safety and comfort. But they will be costly. You know, disasters seem to strike all too often, don't they? Mayhem gets our attention. And I'm not talking about the guy with the word. In our own fellowship, there's often sickness and disease and depression and pain and loneliness. And even this morning, as we were singing together and worshiping together, a lot of you just weren't with us. A lot of you were somewhere else and you're distracted by something. Because I can see you in the face. And in this kind of world, the crucial question for us is, does God rule over these things? And our answer to that is an unshaken yes, because the Bible makes it abundantly clear to us in Exodus 4, verse 11, where it says, Who has made man's mouth? Who has made him mute, or deaf, or seen, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And in Mark 4, verse 41, we're reminded that even the wind and the sea obey him. So the world is not outside of God's control. Does he allow things to happen? Absolutely. But it's always within his control. He's never surprised by anything. And so our answer to that question earlier is yes, floods and tornadoes and hurricanes and refugees and cancer. God rules over all of these things. But that is not the only crucial question that we have to ask this morning. Here's another one. How do we become the kind of people who will break out of our apathy and throw off our need for ease and plenty and risk our possessions and our lives in the course of love and good works. How do we stir each other up to be people like that? That is what is needed in our world around us, in our world of misery like the one that we live in. And guess what? We don't even have to leave our neighborhood to do that. Whenever God does a thing, he has more than one purpose for doing it. God is not simple. He's complex. He does many things at one time. He is unique. How he deals with every person is unique. And he has different purposes for billions of people on our planet. So do not judge the purposes of God prematurely. It's not for us to say to God, God, this is a bad thing, or this is a good thing. Because we don't have all the facts. We're reminded of a story. An old farmer had a stallion horse, 
who, when he took it to a country show, it won a prize, won a first prize, really. And so his neighbor, when he got back home, came by uh, to congratulate his friend and neighbor on winning that first prize. And he said, that's good. And the farmer looked at him and said, how do you know what's good and what's bad? The next day, some thieves came, and they stole that horse, a valuable animal. And the neighbor came by and said, oh, that's bad. <coughs> and the farmer said, how do you know what's good or bad? A few days later, a spirited stallion escaped from the thieves, ran and joined a herd of wild mares, and led all those mares back to the farmer's farm. And the neighbor came by to share the farmer's joy. He said, that's great, that's wonderful, that's good. And the farmer said, how do you know that this is good or bad? Well, the next day, while trying to break in one of the new mares that joined the farm, the farmer's son got thrown off and fractured his leg. And the neighbor called to share the farmer's sorrow, but the old man's attitude was just the same. How do you know what is good or bad? Very next week, the army passed by, and as they did so, they were forcibly constricting new soldiers for the army for the war. But they could not take the farmer's son because he could not walk. And the neighbor, before he even said anything, he just wondered. I wonder if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Don't judge things too prematurely. If God shows his power and his justice on the one side to bring a flood or disease or war or death, he will show his power and his mercy on the other side, not only by waking people up to their need for him, but also by stirring people up to love and good works. And how does he do that? How may we join him in doing that? Verses 32 and 33, the writer describes a painful and tragic situation of persecution and imprisonment. And it happened some time ago to the church that he's writing this letter to. And he wants them to remember it. He just brings it up. It's like, remember when this happened. Look at verses 32 and 33. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. Notice that there are two ways that they suffered. One was directly, it says, by hard struggle with sufferings. That was some kind of persecution that they had to endure and they experienced. <coughs> The other was by choosing to share the sufferings of others, those who uh, were partners with those so treated. The question is, is how did these Christians become the kind of people that would willingly do that, that would choose to be sharers in the sufferings with their neighbors? The answer, of course, is given in verse 34. For you had compassion on those in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plunderings of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. They showed sympathy, and they showed compassion to the prisoners. They became sharers in the sufferings of others. Some were imprisoned, and others broke out of their apathy, and they walked away from their comfort, and they walked away from their possessions and their security, and they risked their lives to go join the others in their suffering. And what was the result? result? What, was, what did they get for doing that? Well, they just got more persecution. Verse 34 says that their property was seized and plundered. It may have been an official act of the government. It may have just been a band of thieves. In any case, they lost some or all of their possessions because they were stirred up to love and good works. Love will be costly. 
We are to be together, he says, to stimulate one another to love and good works. And he's saying this is what it looks like. This is a prime example of how it looks. When some people suffer, others will leave their security and leave their comfort and take risks and share in the lives of those that are hurting. Now, how do they become like that? How do we become the kind of people who are stirred up to love and good works? The last part of verse 34 gives the answer. It says that they uh, knew that they had a better possession and an abiding one. Now, first of all, to notice that this love and this chosen suffering that they endured was not a morose, it wasn't gloomy, it wasn't a miserable duty that they just thought they had to do. Because Christians are supposed to, I mean, have you ever done something you, well, Christians are just supposed to do that. They did it out of love. They did it from a position of joy. It says that they joyfully accepted the seizure of their property. Now, how many of this morning? You go home and there's somebody waiting. They're just, they're just taking all your stuff. They're just putting it in the van. And you just get real excited about that. All right, let me help you pack. <laughs> Come by us. I might help you pack. <laughs> it's kind of like this. Suppose that a tornado comes through by you. And it can happen, right? It's happened before. And, and let's just say that your Sunday school class or your small group decides to get together and you're going to take the victims of that storm, you're going to take them clothes, and you're going to take them items that they need, and you're going to take them food. And then after you get do done doing all that, you go back to your house and somebody, while you've gone, has spray painted on the side of your house, Christians, get out. And instead of having a nice home to come to your windows are broken. And you go inside and all of your drawers and all of your cabinets have been rifled through and plundered. And what if, instead of getting angry, instead of getting mad and discouraged, you went and found your friends in your small group. You went and found your friends in your Sunday school class. And you prayed together and you sang together a song of joy in God that he counted you worthy to suffer for his name. And that's, that's evidently what they did. They went to help other people, and they lost their possessions in the process. And they didn't get angry about it. It says they joyfully accepted the seizure of their possessions. But how did they become the people like this? How did they come, become people that would do this? This is utterly against the way that human beings are by nature. We are by nature selfish creatures. We love safety. We love comfort. And we love ease and fun and lots of possessions and money and a whole bunch of free time to do whatever we want to do with that free time. And if we get all that, then we're happy people, right? And we rejoice. And if we don't, what do we do? We start complaining. But here, right here in chapter 10, here are some people who rejoice when they lose their possessions and they share in sufferings with other people. So there's, somehow there's an indomitable joy and this joy seems to be one of the keys to love and good works. How do you do good love and good works? You do it from an attitude, a position of joy. The key to indomitable joy that produces love and good works that shares in the loss of property others uh, have experienced is knowing that you yourselves have a better possession. A better possession. And an abiding one, it says. When you know that you have a better and a lasting possession, you are not and you will not be paralyzed by loss. <clears throat> if that better possession is great enough, you'll even be able to rejoice in loss. So what is this better possession? What is this one that's abiding, that's lasting? Well, it's all the good news that we've been pondering for some time now in the book of Hebrews. It is the triumph of Jesus over 
death. It's the final rest for the saints in the age to come. It's the subduing of all of our enemies. It's the perfect purification of all of our consciences. It's the removal and the forgetting of all of our sins. It's that we can be close to God and near to God and know God and know that he will be our God forever. In other words, the better abiding possession is not a thing. It's a person. His name is Jesus. And he gives us a great salvation, a great relationship of acceptance with God and fellowship with God and enjoyment of God forever. Notice the two adjectives that are used here. He says it's better and it's abiding. It's better than anything that this world could ever offer. I mean, you, you're old enough and mature enough to know this world has nothing to offer me. And the longer you live on this earth, the more you come to realize that. And it lasts longer than anything else that this world can offer. It's like Psalm 16, verse 11, where David says, You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. That's something that's better than the world can offer. Fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's lasting. It's abiding. The key to indomitable joy that releases love and good works and that embraces suffering with those who suffer it, knowing that you have this lasting, better possession. The key there is knowing. Do you know it? I remember an old preacher used to say it all the time, almost every Sunday. Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? Do you know it this morning? Are you secure in your salvation? Do you have this confidence? Because he says you can and you must. It's a deep confidence about your future that frees you from fear. It frees you from greed. It frees you from all these other things that grab our attention and keep us from loving one another as we should. So where does this knowing Come from? Where, where does this confidence come from? The answer to that is what this whole book has been about. Our confidence comes from Christ. What he did perfectly on the cross and at the resurrection and what he's doing now for us in heaven and what he's going to keep on doing for us and what he will do for us at the second coming and for all of eternity. Christ is the one who destroyed forever the power of death. Christ is the high priest who opens the way to the throne of grace. Christ is the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. Christ is the one whose blood cleanses our consciences and he has obtained an eternal redemption. Christ's death is a single sacrifice that perfects us for all time. Christ will make all his enemies a footstool for his feet. Christ will come again a second time to save all who are eagerly awaiting for him. Christ is the mediator of a new and better covenant that, that ensures the forgiveness of our sins. And all that we can ever hope for is owing to Jesus Christ. We receive it not by earning it, not by meriting it, not by buying it, but I'll tell you what, we can make it. It is certain. It is sure. It is the one thing that we can ever trust in this life. Christ is a seal. He is a guarantee of our hope and all the promises of God. So what then are the practical implications of this stirring up one another to love and good works in the face of great suffering? They're too simple, but they're very great things. First, we must remind each other continually how terrible is the price of throwing away our confidence. Don't throw away your confidence. Look at verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. The second thing, we must remind each other continually how great is the reward of cherishing the promises of God above earthly things. Look at verse 36. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So not only do we have 
have this lasting and better possession that, that is greater than anything that the world could possibly offer. He says, look, this is precious. Don't throw it away. Don't squander it. And we need to endure. We need to receive what is promised. And you see both of these things talked about in verses 38 and 39, where it says, My righteous one shall live by faith. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. In other words, don't look back. Don't look at the temporary cost of love and shrink back from confidence in God's infinitely superior promises. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That is eternal. That goes on and on and on and on forever. And so we warn each other, don't drift away. Don't love the world, the things of the world. Don't start thinking that nothing huge is at stake here, but mainly we must focus on the preciousness of the promises and help each other to understand the value above all things, how great the reward is that Christ has purchased for us. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Let us help each other. Let us help each other see it. And realize the greatness of the reward of what Christ has purchased for all who value it above the world. Let us see it in one another. Let us savor it as we do. So wake up. Believe. Rejoice. And love.